Hey friends! Welcome to a special edition of the Humbug Vlog. I know this is going to be a little out of order, but unfortunately one of the things that I really needed to make the vlog that was supposed to come out on Monday happen still hasn't shown up yet. I had some shipping issues with it. So I decided to flip-flop the order of the vlogs and do the vlog that was supposed to come out on Monday for today. I truly think fate intervened in this, that I was supposed to release this episode early because I'm so excited to share it with you. This was something that I wanted to have as part of the vlog from the first kind of idea I had of putting together a vlog about this show. In this episode, I sit down with Nat Fuller, who is a well-renowned actor in the Twin Cities. He is probably best known for his performances at the Guthrie Theater, specifically in their annual production of A Christmas Carol, which he has been part of since 1988. As Nat says in the vlog, he has played every adult male role in the show, with the exception of The Ghost of Christmas Present and Mr. Fezziwig. In this episode, we sit down, we talk about A Christmas Carol, we talk about our experiences with the show, and Nat shares some of his incredible wisdom and experiences from being part of the show for as long as he has. He also talks about the upcoming made for streaming production of A Christmas Carol that the Guthrie is doing this year in place of their annual production. I will post all the information about that production down in the description box below. So without further ado, here is Nate and Nat talk a Christmas Carol. Joining me today is Nathaniel Fuller. He is the resident Ebenezer Scrooge at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, has been part of the production for over two decades. And I am so excited because I have been watching him in this show since I was eight years old. And I'm so excited to get to talk to him about A Christmas Carol. So welcome, Nat. Thank you. It's great to be with you. So I think I, I said in there over two decades, but I feel like that might be underselling it. What, yeah, what is over the- Over three now. Over three. Wow. Okay. So I did when- my first uh, Christmas Carol in, um, it would have been uh, December of 88. Okay. Um, and I think so- I've totally missed one since then. Wow. So who did who were who were you in that first first production? I, I was Marley. Okay, yeah. so that was that was the first go around with Jacob Marley because I know you yeah. you played him several times. I've had several go rounds with him since then. Since we're talking about Marley, how how has his progression changed over the years for you? Uh, I think the thing about Marley when I first played him was that I was really concentrating on you know coming up from the dead and being uh, the horror of what it had been like to be in this world of the dead. Mm -hmm. So I put on some, what I thought was very scary, ghostly makeup. And, uh, and I wanted to, I thought the, the achievement was if I could scare some of the little kids in the audience. And actually I put on the makeup, my daughter was, I think she was about three or, let's see, 88. She would have been four, I think. And I was putting on the makeup and she was watching me put on the makeup. And she said, no, stop, daddy, stop. Don't do it. And she could see that it was makeup. But as she yeah. saw my transformation, she, she got scared. And then I went up and showed her when she was in her, she ran away and went up into mommy's arms. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, uh, you know, how can I get this, this feeling of being from this dead world that was terribly frightening because of the mistakes I'd made. And later on, uh, I keep, I wanted to keep some of that ghostliness and some of the mystery. I mean, that's part of the charm of the story, I think. Is that it. But it was more important to concentrate on getting the message through to Scrooge of what he needed to do. And so I think, I think there's a more human aspect, but I'm trying to combine, I'm still trying to combine the, the inhuman, the no longer human with what, what it was like, but just uh, the, the regret and communicating him how important it is for him to listen to what I have to say, because he, Scrooge doesn't want to listen to Marley. Right. Well, he doesn't believe he's real. Right, right. Uh, he thinks he's a, maybe an undigested bit of beef or something he ate last night. 
other than, so Marley, obviously you play Scrooge. Who else have you had the chance of getting to know over the years? Well, I like to think that I've played every uh, adult role in the show, except for Christmas Present and um, Mr. Fezziwig. Wow. Which, you know, it's not really suitable casting, so I'll probably never play those roles. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've played I've played people that are no longer in the show. Um, you know, certain types of uh, businessmen and vicars and preachers and things like that. And uh, uh, Fred and and wow. Bob Pratchett, um, the Poulterer, Old Joe, you know, things like that. So. I know them. I know them pretty well. In an interview I saw with you, you talked that you re read the book every yes. every year. Yeah, um, I didn't this year for okay. this version for some reason. Probably because I was reading his original script. But right. normally I do read it um, before doing the show. Do you do you feel that when you read it, you're reading it with the lens of like if you read it this year, like the lens of 2020? And then you're finding new things in it, or what is your what is your intent with that? I did that myself this year, was going through and starting clean with it. But what was your yeah. intention with it? Well, I love the story and I love the book. And I love I want to understand Dickens' intent in telling the story as much as I can. And uh, and also if I'm looking at a line in the play, I wanna know how it relates to, to what Dickens may have said. Sometimes the line is changed. Uh, sometimes uh, the person has changed a line which goes contrary to what Dickens' intent was. Uh, I wanna know that, I wanna know the subtleties as he just, you know, to remember how he described what Scrooge was feeling. Because I feel for the most part that Dickens was right on about this character of Scrooge. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times in productions, we tend to want to misunderstand what Scrooge was for our own purposes. Mm -hmm. So I go back to look at that. I look up notes to make sure I know the meanings of the words and the context, context of the words um, and the feeling that Dickens creates for these various scenes so that we can go back to that and try not to get too off track in our production. Yeah, Does that makes sense. And sometimes, yeah. I'll fight for a phrase in which a playwright or a, or a dramaturg has altered the phrase for some reason that, that I don't understand. And I say, you know, in the original, it said this. <laughs> kind of meant that. And could we go back to, and sometimes I win, sometimes I yeah. don't. But. I, I did that in one, one production. Um, they modernized a bunch of, of the phrasing and it just, it felt clunky and awkward on on some of the things and yeah fighting um there are some of the things obviously you have to change yeah but yeah but that is one of my pet peeves it, the, the uh the idea that uh we need to make the story uh for five-year-olds right accessible for five-year-olds or six at the guthrie don't recommend anybody under five coming but let's say yeah middle schoolers or something like that and so sometimes they're very cautious about dumbing down that's a bad term, about modernizing some of the words mm -hmm. so that uh, the eight-year-old or the 13-year-old gets it immediately. And I would love, of course, I've read it so much, I know what these words mean, but even so, back when I didn't, you'd hear a word that you didn't know, and but it would be so interesting and so peculiar and so vivid that I think, let's stretch people, let them feel the context of it. I mean, how much is it destroying their imagine, their uh, experience of the show if they don't quite know what it means, but they get to hear a word that they've never heard before. Yeah, the one that always I always go back and forth on is when Scrooge tells Marley, um, you are chained or you are fettered. Yeah. And that one, I like, I love the fettered, but it goes by so quickly that I'm, I always worry when I change it that- But, but it, then of course he explains it right away is the change yep. I wear, I, you know, I made in life. Fettered is hard because, uh, especially with an English accent, when you yeah. don't pronounce the R, yep. it could be fetid. Yep. You know, they don't, nobody knows quite what they've heard. So yep. 
but we use fettered, fetid, you know, you are fetid, but, but um, you know, they'll figure it out. They'll exactly. figure it out. And, and you get yep. to hear that word rather than yeah. chain, you know? And I like, I like the idea that you hear new words. Let's, let's jump to the, to the miser himself then. You first played him in the 90s. Right. Um, had you understudied him yes. prior to that? Okay. Yes. So when you, when you play him, obviously you have full kind of control over, over the shape of him and, and everything. But when you understudy, you're having to step into someone else's interpretation mm -hmm. of him. Do you find that understudying him, you approach it? differently then are you more conscious of what the other actor is doing in their interpretation and yeah you have to uh you obviously have to get to point a point b point c in order to do the show so that so that you don't disrupt the production and the pace and the rhythm with what all all the other actors are depending on you for and as you're doing it uh as i'm sure you discovered you're going oh well this is how i would do it <laughs> And this is, oh, yeah, I would. Uh, and then sometimes you see an actor do something and you go, that's brilliant, but I can't do that. Yeah. It just doesn't come out of my body the same way. Yep. So you have to find a way to, um, to preserve the values that the production has agreed on, but, but in some ways make it your own. And sometimes if I feel passionate about a certain thing, I wanna do it my way but it has to be in a way that is consistent with the way that the, the show is going. So there's a constant tension in doing that. But, but right. since you're not, if I'm not on stage, well, a lot of times I was understudying Scrooge and playing another part. Right. So there would be parts of uh, his performance that it would be hard to see. I'd have to go look up archival video or something. Or I used to lurk around the back of the stage with a little recorder yeah. and, uh, and I'd be in the Fezzi party, you know, and, uh, or somewhere else. And, and so we'd run off stage and Scrooge would still be out there doing this. So I'm peeking around the corner during the rehearsals and the technical is going, now he's going here, he's going to the right, get to the, yeah. you know, and figuring out how to do it. So there's, I don't know, there's a tension between what you want to do. You have, you have limited self-expression in it um, as opposed to when you're playing the role. But all the time I'm doing that, I'm thinking, boy, if I ever get a chance to do this on my own, I'm going to try to get <laughs> some of my own ideas in here. Yeah. And so then you did. Um, you did, well, I know. Um, I did. And did. back in the 90s, um, it was very difficult because the director had a very different idea of who Scrooge was than I did. And in, 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 some, in some cases, I think I was right. In some cases, she was uh, right. And so... Uh, we had to evolve a way of working together on it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what my rule is, is that I'll bring my idea to the table. And then if the, if the director or in discussion, and if the director doesn't like it, uh, the director will say, you know, if they're nice, they'll say, well, I understand what we need to do this, or we right. need to be more this way. And then I'll try to explain what it is that I'm trying to do. And once I feel like I've been sort of understood, then it's my job to get with the program. You know, I don't, I don't fight for that anymore. So I just have to figure out a way to, okay, because I'm working with a whole ensemble and I'm not going to sit here and hold this up. So basically, I just want to communicate what it is I want to do and why I want to do it. And then I'm paid to, you know, put on the show the way it's supposed to be put on. And so, so then what happens is, uh, in my mind, I do a gymnastic in which I adapt so that that becomes now part of my life. Yeah. A living, breathing Scrooge. So it's an interesting trick that you do. You, you, you get your confines, you know, bounded in a nutshell. And, uh, and then I have to figure out how to be the king of intimate space. <laughs> That's what I said. You know, and, and, and so you do that. And ultimately what happens is I find, oh, now I'm living, I'm living fully within this space now. So, um, 
But then if I get a chance to do it again, sometimes as I did years later with a different director, uh, I go back to the original and I think, geez, let's see if we can get this, these ideas in. You know? For one thing, I don't think that Scrooge is uh, nasty. Mm. He is, he doesn't want to be bothered. And so he comes off as being, and he is uncaring because he's shutting all of that stuff out. And when people really try to get through to him to get him to feel something, then he's resentful. It comes partly out of fear. No, no, I don't want that. Get, get away from me. I don't think that he, for instance, we've had instances in which he takes his stick and he beats a little child and comes in, you know, whacks him. I don't think Scrooge ever hits anybody. No. Uh, he... In the original, he raises his ruler when that kid comes to the door, which is enough to make him say, don't bother me, you know. Um, so, and, and in this last production that we've done, the most recent one, we brought that to fruition. He wasn't, you know, used to be, he would be growling on the streets, and, you know, and raising his stick. And now when the, the little kid comes up and asks him for something, he just slowly raises it like, and the kid knows enough to go away. And I think that's the other thing about Scrooge, the way Dickens describes him with the frostiness and the coldness, he doesn't have to be growling and snarling all the time. If, if you look at him, you just get a feeling that you don't wanna go near him. And that was one of what I liked about the recent productions we've done it because it's in staging it, you have to get all the other people on stage to have this reaction. And it's not a big violent, you look at Scrooge and you go, oh, 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 oh. you know, it's just kind of, oh my God, I, I don't think I want to go near that guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, so, and, and it's, and so he has that, it's a much more powerful effect than if Scrooge is running around the stage, going, get out of my way, all of that kind right. of stuff, you know, so, so there, that was, that was part of it. Moment in the narration. I mean, there are those like growling references and things. And I think that's, yeah. Um, like it'll say like Scrooge left the office with a growl like I think there are those little references to some of those and I think that's where he almost becomes cartoony when mm -hmm. you start exaggerating out and you lose his kind of the well, growl is just you know get away it doesn't have to be like rah right. yeah like, uh, there's a line in the narration that talks about the blind man's dogs yes want to, like pulling their masters away, you know? And I think that, you know, it's not like Scrooge is, you know, kicking puppies or anything. No, no, the dog just knows by looking yeah. at him. You yeah. just squeeze him and get out of it. And, oh, get away from that guy. It's just not, it's just coldness, coldness. Yeah. And I think that was the, the thing that um, Scrooge gets hot in the office with uh, with the young solicitors and with Fred, because he has to, because, because he's, they bug him, you yes. know? They just bug him too much, but but he doesn't go out of his way to be to be hot with people. It's the coldness, the frostiness that Dickens describes that I like to get, and it just gives everybody a cold chill. One of my favorite moments of the Guthrie's production was in in the the set that you guys used to have. There was the grate that would be like unlit from below. Yeah. And there was always- yeah. and, and when it was with Marley, your chains would get caught in that grate <laughs> and you stuck on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is where you learn all of the, the behind the scenes <laughs> <laughs> secrets. But there was, um, there was a moment where they would like, Scrooge would stand above that yeah. and the narration and just that like cold, um, the, like the steam coming from the grate and all of that just in the description of him and just standing there, that stillness. And that was something that was so powerful on that stage that, you know, I mean, the Guthrie's, the thrust of the, the Guthrie stages are, is, is so incredible, but that it was like, he was right there. You know, yeah. but you got to experience that stillness of him. And the, I think there were several of the Scrooges that I, I remember that that was like a defining moment of whether their version of him I felt was going to work or not. If he could just like stand there in yeah. that moment and own that coldness, like you said. I think, yeah, I agree with you totally. I think that, especially on the thrust stage where you've got, 
it's very hard to maintain focus. And so sometimes you, and you got to keep moving, you got to change the orientation. So figuring out ways to uh, preserve the magic of stillness and the power of stillness is, uh, is a challenge. Yeah. But I really believe in it. As Scrooge, you know, you never get to leave. Now, do you have, yeah, do you have an intermission in your? I do, yeah. Um, yeah same because... spot. I, I feel the, the ghost of Christmas past um, when Scrooge sees the faces and, and all of that in, in kind of, you know, sees the, the, the reflections in the ghost's face. Yeah. I feel is such a powerful ending. And then to have the like gong of, you know, bell for, you know, the next, next night is such a powerful intermission point. That's one of the oh, things that I, it's just, it's so, yeah, it's such a powerful moment, but yeah, it's, it's a powerhouse up until. I need it. Well, yeah. you know, and part of it playing screws because you're not off the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and we used to have a, during the dance fezzy party, Scrooge could go off and briefly, but now we don't. So what that means is because you're doing, you're doing all the talking yourself, uh, and I don't do all the talking myself in the, in the production, but you need to be hydrated. Yep. Which means that, that, at least for me, I have to wait for the very last minute before places to, to go to the bathroom before I go on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i do have i do have the luxury that dickens had on his reading desk he had a little shelf that had a uh, like glass decanter for for water and so anytime there is a toast or like the fiddler you know gets his you know porter i'm like i'm getting a drink because this is <laughs> the only time um That's good yeah it's it's a lot. So, okay. So that was one thing. One of the other things I had asked you kind of in the prep was what are some things you do to kind of get in, get in shape, I guess, for, for the role, or do you, do you have like a warm up routine? Cause he's yeah, very, yeah. Physical. Well, it's a very physical. In the role. first place, um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of speaking and, um, and on the Guthrie stage, you basically have to shout the whole time. And you have to do it without sounding like you're shouting. So at least I try. And so uh, it's going to be, it's, it's almost like a vocal gymnastic out there. So I spend uh, the rehearsal period and uh, even time before the first rehearsal, uh, working on vocals and breathing exercises, memorizing the lines, always trying to keep the voice relaxed trying to keep the flow going. I have a great tendency when I'm uh, tense to tense up in the shoulders and the shoulders come up and the voice will get tight. So I'm continually checking that and, uh, and just making sure that everything is open and flowing. And then, um, and the other thing that I, I do, I, I'm a person who likes, uh, you know, a, a cocktail or a little wine in the evening. Uh, but from the time of the, first rehearsal for Christmas Carol, I just go off any kind of alcohol through the whole thing. Uh, it, uh, you know, I mean, when you're doing the performances, I would never drink before the performances, but for some shows I'm doing, I might come home and have something to unwind afterwards. And, and I don't do that anymore because I feel that I, when I'm performing, because I feel like I sleep better. Mm. I don't do that. And sleeping and rest is really important to me. Yep. So, so I just have to swear off it during that time. And then, um, and then when I come into the show, usually uh, I come in uh, a half hour before half hour. Okay. And then I go, there's usually a quick change room or someplace where I can stretch and warm up and try to get everything relaxed and flowing and easy breathing. And that allows me, uh, Usually at half hour, I need to be in wigs for my wig. So I can do that and uh, have, uh, have my water ready. I had been doing a combination of uh, water, uh, of, of like Gatorade diluted with water. Yep. And uh, so I would take some of that 
And it's, it's very difficult because you're in the middle of the flu season. I always get a flu shot. That's part of the preparation. You're in the middle of the flu season. Of course, this year it's, it's completely off the charts where we're not even doing the show, but, but, and you have children coming in from their different schools, the disease is all around you. So washing hands, trying not to touch my face, you know, we've been doing that. And I never, uh, you know, everybody's bringing in little goodies, finger food, which I never reach into. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to catch the disease, but also it's very dry. Mm -hmm. And so it's tough to keep your voice in shape. Yeah. And so uh, I'm, I have a series of uh, exercise and vocal warm-up exercises that I do to, to try to get ready and then, then go on and do the show. It isn't a simple show by any no. to do. It, it is the ghost story. And so there are, you know, all of the special effects and all the safety things that come with that, you know, trap doors and um, flying in, in the current production. Mm -hmm. um, you have, yeah, and then and just the fact that Scrooge is just like going, 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 going the whole time, and the there are just so many, so many cues, so many special effects and things that are all just timed to precision, and that it's you have to be focused in a way that you know, obviously, doing the the solo version is a totally different level. The solo version is much more demanding because yeah. I can spend a lot of time uh, watching where I'm not speaking, yep. swallowing, working up saliva while somebody right. else is speaking. But in, in my, my obligation there is I, I have uh, a, an inner monologue for all of those scenes because I feel that, that every one of those scenes, the Cratchit scene, the Fezziwig scene and so on is having an effect on Scrooge. Yep. And if the play is working right, the audience wants to know how is this affecting Scrooge? So I'm, I'm in the scenes, I'm relating to the scenes. I'm not always the focus of the scenes, but if anybody looks at me, I want them to think that I have a specific relationship to, uh, to anything that's being said at that time. That's one of the things that I feel I always worry about in the solo version, because I think those are so important those, those reactions. And mm -hmm. I always, I purposely looking at it again, this time building those moments in before Scrooge says a line so that at least I'm like in the, you know, the physical state of the reaction of what he saw before he, like with the ghost of Christmas present when talking about tiny Tim, that it's it sees it and then turns to the ghost and asks the line. It's, a, it's real challenging. And I realize that uh, because uh, we're in this streaming thing that we're doing, we're all storytellers. So I'm just going from, I'm, my part is from Christmas future to the end. I'm a storyteller and I'm a character in the scene and I'm Scrooge watching and reacting to the scene. And I may be the storyteller reacting to Scrooge and and it's it's a fascinating challenge to go in and out and how much do you do that you know uh, for instance if uh, if Scrooge is suffering mm -hmm. the storyteller isn't suffering as Scrooge suffered but he's sympathetic which is a different kind of way of telling the story or maybe he's reversing his attitude towards Scrooge you know he might be commenting on Scrooge's suffering so. You know, I, I think your challenge is a wonderful actor's challenge. Yeah, it is. And uh, I just appreciate what you're, what you're gonna do with it. Just a little bit that I did with it, I found yeah. was really, really challenging. So it's, it's exciting, it's an exciting. And, it, and what's fun is when you do it, I think is the way that you're gonna take the audience's imagination from one thing to the next, which is exactly what Dickens did in exactly. his- Exactly, yeah. You know? So speaking of Dickens, um, in the first adaptation, that was done from the very beginning all the way well into the 90s. Um, I believe Charles Dickens was the, the narrator. Did you yep. ever get to step into this? I did, I, and I loved it. I loved it. I got right into the storytelling. And the thing was that you had to come into a scene or go through a scene and grab the attention of the audience and, and get them excited about the next scene. I don't know how well I did it, but I, <laughs> I loved uh, throwing myself into it as, 
as Dickens and being in different parts. The, uh, in some versions, and, and I wasn't in them so much, um, I, I didn't play Dickens in, in, in some of the versions where they thought the story is also about Dickens. Because, you know, historically, they're talking about how Dickens was worried about money and was worried about family and doing and he, So he was using his own, there's a lot of heartfeltness about him. Uh, so, so you could say that, uh, that the story operates on several levels when you're using right. Dickens. It's about Scrooge and it's about Dickens. And Dickens goes in and out of the family. And, and I, I kind of think that's a mistake. I think that, that, uh, takes away from the simplicity of the story. I think the story is much more powerful when it's about Scrooge. And if Dickens is narrating, he's narrating in a way that should be focusing the story onto yes. Scrooge. Yeah, I, I think one that's been one of the challenges for me in this version is Dickens is a character because he's all of the characters. Sure, he's the and, spirit at your elbow. Yeah, ex yes, exactly. And playing the the moments, I mean, he was, he was an actor. He was yeah, an actor, a director, a playwright. So he obviously understood the, the theatricality of it. There's a brilliant book about him and his, and his readings. And in there, it talks about how he studied gestures to convey meanings and things and things that probably we wouldn't do as our Stanislavski based actors today but you would uh, study that del sart technique where you had a gesture for every I, emotion i think that's kind of what it what it was and so i wanted to be faithful to him as a as a character and do do the research um one of my favorite facts that i learned this time is that his iconic beard he grew for a play that he was in so he didn't have that thing until he was oh really yeah. I know that. I remember pictures of him as a young man with no beard. Yeah. And so factoring, like, you know, knowing how, how much of an actor that, that he was, I, I wanted to, you know, still have him be a character, like flesh out Dickens. What does he sound like? What is his physicality like? But then also knowing it's Dickens playing Scrooge. Mm-hmm. I think if you get too meta with it, where it's like, this is a Dickens commenting on his life and his experiences and all of that, then that's going to carry too much into him. Exactly. He, he does say in the prologue that he endeavored upon this ghost little book to bring about a ghost of an idea. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea is what matters. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. My, uh, I, I thought about uh, growing a, a Dickens type beard for, for this streaming yeah. thing. Um, but I, the customer said, no, we'd like to have chops. So yeah. I've got the chop. We've shot, I'm, I'm just holding these until Tuesday when the yeah. editor finds out that they're not gonna need to reshoot anything. And then I'm gonna go back to my, my normal yes. face. Um. I, I have, yeah, I started growing the sideburns out just because I have I have a wig um, that we styled to look like younger Dickens because I my hairline is is too right. too thick for what he ended up with later. One of the things that popped into my head that I had meant to ask you, do you ever find yourself getting confused as to which version? Like, do you ever like get? Oh lost yes. Into which oh, version? Yeah. Of it you know, doing? my problem is not learning the script. My problem is unlearning all the other script. <laughs> the the first time I played Scrooge, I was alternating with Richard Holmes. Yes. Back, Sari Ketter was directing it, and I was he was up working on, uh, and he had done it for several years before that. You know, several years, and uh, so I'm sitting there watching him, and he says the wrong line and the script person corrects him on the line. And I turned to Sari and I said, it's not the wrong line. It's just the wrong year. <laughs> and, and the muscle memory is incredible. Yeah. When I go in to rehearse and uh, wanting to say something that's supposed to be there or, or the author for the next year has just inverted these words for some reason that I don't understand. 
Yeah, it's there. And I'll be sometimes on the stage in performance, having rehearsed it for, you know, how many weeks it is. And they'll still have this big urge for some yeah. other thing to come out. Speaking of Richard Holmes, I, I loved watching him, like when he would play like how many different characters in one, he would play like Jacob Marley and the Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come and the Black, like he'd play all of those. And I was just like, how? And then the more I thought about it, I was like, he's played every role in the show, I'm sure at <laughs> and some point. It. So, and directed it, yeah. So I'm sure it was just like, well, okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the there was just so so much watching it was the first professional production I ever saw um was the year uh Kelsey Grammer narrated with the the pre-recorded and um you were you were Jacob Marley and just seeing that that was possible in a, and, in and a that's a big thing about the responsibility of this show is that in this town for literally thousands of people young people yeah. every year it's the first professional live theater that they ever see yeah and we have you know this huge student program and and we've raised a lot of money to allow students to come for free and so there's a big uh, big responsibility there too and I think it's what a story to introduce people to the magic of theater with, you know, not only do you have the actors on stage, but, you know, like we've said, it's, it's the ghost story and just all of the tech that's required to do that. And how many people can get inspired by, you know, those, I, I always remember the, the stair trap. Yeah that would just descend and just the technology behind that and knowing that somebody had to figure out how to do that and how many kids were inspired in that regard whether it was the set or the lights or the special effects you know we, we oh, think yes. it's actors too but there's so much to the show that to really make it work which obviously the Guthrie has for you know, how, how many years it's, that's, I think one of the reasons why it's so important to do because we're, we get to inspire on so many different levels with it and say, this is possible. This isn't yeah. a movie. There's no CGI here. This is, this I is agree. live. Yeah. So far there isn't anyway. Yeah. yeah. The stage managers always say that this show has more cues for the stage manager to call than any other show that we do year after year. This was this was so cool. And oh, I'm glad. It's I'm great to talk so to you. And yeah. and I'm be anxious to see how this project goes. It seems like just a wonderful idea and a perfect year to do it. It is. Yeah, so. it's something I've wanted to do for a while. And I just, yeah, it. I think there were so many things that I was seeing, especially early. I started kind of coming up with this in July. And so I don't think you guys had even announced that you guys were were doing anything with it. I knew the production and the 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 live production had been canceled, but there were yeah. so many productions that I was I was seeing were canceled, and I just it felt so wrong to me to to not have some version of the show. And I've been sitting on wanting to do it this way for for several years, and I just decided I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. And I feel there's, like I said in the prologue, that he wrote it, you know, to bring about an idea. And it's the question of even now, what's possible? Like, what is possible? Because I, you know, so many of us feel our industry is like entirely shut down and losing hope. And it's, we can still create, we can still be actors just because our career isn't you know, we might not be getting paid or it might not be at the, the venues that you we gotta normally- got to find your creative outlet. To find it and we can still create art and still do the things. And that was kind of that, more than ever, I think that pro, that, um, not prologue, the um, dedication that he did at the beginning, the preface. Yeah, and, and so you can give something to, uh, you give something to audiences, fulfill yep. a need for them too. Yep. Yeah, it's a good time of year for it. And it's a great, this year is a great year for it. So 
I yeah. wish you the best of luck for it. Thank you. So I look forward to seeing your version. Um, I will make sure that I put all of the links to the Guthrie's. Right. Yeah, you just go on the website and you can get all the details. So yep. um, great cast. I mean, I can't imagine a better group of the four to to be telling the story. Who's who's doing who's doing which? Uh, Charity is doing the opening through Marley. Okay. Ryan Colbert is doing the uh, Christmas past. Okay. Megan Kreidler is doing uh, Christmas present. And then I'm doing from future to the end. Okay. So everyone's kind of doing their... Yeah. I, I don't see... I, I haven't seen any of the other actors since we did our virtual... Uh, we did a virtual rehearsal. And then I saw them. We did a virtual uh, rap party. But as far as the work, I never saw them. And of course, we were under strict COVID protocols. Right. I got tested three times a week. Everybody was masked except the actor when they were either in the dressing room or on stage. It's, and, it's uh, been cool seeing all of the behind the scenes photos and, and things that, that have been posted about it. So, oh, great. I haven't seen, yeah. I saw them at our rap party, but I didn't see them posted. But yeah, yeah. there was one of you recording in the, in the cemetery. Yeah. Uh, they, that they posted, um, which was, which was really cool. So. Oh, great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you're you welcome. Nat it's a pleasure to reconnect with you. Yeah. I would like to say a huge thank you to Nat Fuller for taking the time to share his wisdom and his experience with me in this chat. I would also like to give a huge shout out to his wife, Kathy, who helped us connect to make this conversation happen. As I said, I will post all of the information about the Guthrie streaming production down in the description box so you can check out Nat in this year's production of the Guthrie's A Christmas Carol. Even if you are planning on watching the production that I'm doing, you can never have too much A Christmas Carol, and it is going to be so cool to get to see Nat tell this iconic story. Have you seen A Christmas Carol at the Guthrie? I would love to hear about your experiences. Comment down in the description box below. That's it for this video. As always, friends, you're awesome, be awesome, and I'll see you next time.